Good afternoon. My name is David Gallo. I am the director of the AIFC Academy of Law. We'd like to welcome all of you from across the globe, Europe, UK, Central Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Thanks so much for joining. The Academy of Law is dedicated to preparing lawyers for international commercial law practice. We look for ways to fill gaps in traditional legal education to adequately prepare practitioners for operating in an increasingly complex global ecosystem. As you all, I'm sure, are aware, the AIFC legal jurisdiction is from the common law tradition. It's in the English language. We operate in a surrounding civil law environment. And the two systems work hand in hand, in fact, are interdependent and together comprise what we think is a perfect storm, a, a, a great context for the economic development and capital markets activities that the AIFC will be undertaking increasingly in the coming years. We're broadcasting from uh, Central Asia today. We're in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan. We have a very exciting and relevant topic in the area of technology. And just to frame the issues and the nature of today's presentation, technology is becoming a part of the fabric of modern Central Asian life and is expected to deliver great benefits for the Central Asian economy and for society on the whole. To encourage the development of socially beneficial applications of technology and to protect the public from adverse consequences, wh whether they're intended or otherwise, effective policies and government regulations are needed in Central Asia. In this first webinar in a series of three, who our speaker will be leading in the coming weeks, and I will introduce him momentarily. But in this first seminar, uh, Professor Amar Yunus will shed a light on the legal progression of technology law in Central Asia. And he will highlight the approaches which will continue to suffice within the constraints provided by existing governance mechanisms, for example, sector specific regulatory bodies. Now, when you think about legal tech and technology and the law, we typically think in terms of two different aspects to technology. One would be the technology itself, the technology tools that have been developed and will continue uh, to evolve, tools that will be helpful in the administration of justice and in the practice of law. It will create efficiencies, it will create certain uh, quality uh, control uh, benefits, and that's one aspect of legal tech. Today, we're going to be talking about another aspect, and that is technology law. Laws that are needed, laws that are arising, uh, re relating to the new technologies that have created new paradigms and new challenges from a regulatory standpoint and from a rights and liability standpoint. So I won't say any more because our distinguished speaker will pick up this topic momentarily. Amar Yunus is CEO of IMO Innovation Consultants, and he's a long-term resident of Central Asia. He holds seven degrees in medicine, jurisprudence, finance, political marketing, international and comparative politics, human rights, and Chinese law. He has earned these various qualifications from Kyrgyzstan, Italy, Lebanon, and China. His research interests include, but are not limited to, technology law, the societal impact of artificial intelligence, regulation of AI and emerging technologies, human rights, medical law, and Central Asian politics. Well, today's session is called The Legal Progression of Technology Law in Central Asia. But stay tuned, on August 7th, Professor Yunas will deliver another 
AIC Academy of Law webinar on the topic of international technology transfer. I'm sorry, on artificial intelligence regulation and ethics on August 7th. And then on September 4th, he'll deliver a webinar on international technology transfer. So we look forward to that. With that, let me turn the floor over to Professor Amar Yunus. Professor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. David, for this uh, wonderful and elaborated introduction. Uh, I am also very thankful to AIFC Academy of Law for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and of course, to the audience who are joining me for this webinar during these uh, turbulent times this afternoon. So the topic of uh, legal progression, uh, in, especially in uh, technology law, is uh, very new when it comes to the legal progression in general in Central Asia. And uh, uh, some of the elements which you have already highlighted, I wanted to talk about them, but you have already uh, mentioned the difference between uh, legal tech and tech law. I wanted to take start from here that uh, there is a huge difference between uh, legal tech and tech law, but unfortunately people in this region have been using these both terminologies interchangeably. As you very well mentioned that legal tech uh, are the technologies which are actually accessibility tools, lawyers, different law firms, even governmental institutions are using to facilitate the clients. But when it comes to the technology law, we certainly talk about rules and regulations which govern these technologies. Now here is another interesting thing that majority of the people think that the technology law is actually intellectual property laws or information technology laws or internet law. But uh, in fact, uh, technology law, law is not limited to intellectual property law. Uh, I personally think that anything which has elements of automation or any technology should be regulated and all the technologies are the subject matter of technology law. A little bit uh, theoretical background for my uh, legal scientists friends. Uh, technology is something which I personally consider as uh, Leviathan as uh, Thomas Hobb mentioned. Uh, or in more John Locke's terminology, it is something which is parallel to the property because it is uh, highly influential on our social contract and definitely it has potential to disturb the social contract if uh, uh, we mismanage the technology. Uh, why we need to talk about technology at all? People ask me that you are in Central Asia and you are talking about technology law, but the majority of the Central Asian people even don't have access to internet. Uh, less than 10% people in Central Asia, uh, they have access to internet. Why we need to talk about technology at all? But uh, my answer to this is that uh, the same thing or same discussion, similar discussion was uh, happening when we were discussing about uh, making the organizational structure. People are saying that we have barter system, we have uh, different uh, uh, bosses and different types of employees and there is a perfect correlation among themselves. Why we need to have so many different types of organizations? And uh, we didn't foresee the future threats. And today you can see that uh, when it comes to the organizations, people are talking about corporate social morality, people are talking about social businesses. These were some of the things which they didn't foresee in the beginning when we, they were discussing about uh, uh, making different types of organizations. Or uh, you can take the example of uh, environment. In the beginning, no one cared about environment. And today, you know, everyone is worried about uh, the environmental protection. We are actually uh, calculating empirically how much carbon footprint what one company is leaving on this planet. And uh, we are actually, you know, conducting environmental audits as well to see if uh, this company is economic, uh, eco uh, ecologically beneficial for us or not. So similarly, technology is something we should worry about and we should have a, a kind of risk management and to prepare its uh, rules and regulations so that it can be, uh, you know, uh, get, it, it can be used for the benefit, benefits of the mankind. Not only technologies, there are a number of other examples, for example, uh, oil, 
and uh, you you know that the opium in china if we if we take the example or uh, you you have some other uh, for example coffee as a commodity so these are small small things which actually impacted on socio economical political life of individuals residing in a country and uh, in the 21st century we have so many right movements the feminism or the the people with different uh, orientations uh, or the people with colors they are demanding their their rights uh, and these demands are actually uh, a kind of um, threat to the social contract if we don't manage them similarly i personally believe that the technology has a potential to you know uh, disbalance our social contract because uh, it is a very serious thing uh, if we talk about uh, digitalization in central asia which is not my topic but i want to give uh, an overview of uh, this uh, if we look at the digitalization in central asia we have some reports for example the world bank uh, issued a report in 2016 and this conference was organized in kazakhstan where they actually mentioned about digital dividends in central asia so what are these digital dividends digital dividends are the impact of technology on the society it is not about how much one country owes technology but it is the actual impact and they tried to empirically elaborated uh, by showing uh, through different um, Uh, data indicators that technology is actually impacting uh, the lives of central asian people so what were the expected outcomes of this project this project is called as digital casa so there are number of outcomes which are uh, you know expected accessibility to the internet and the integration of technology into the lives of ordinary people these are the some of the expected outcomes many country in central asia still they are trying to you know Uh, reaping the benefits of this world bank project uh if we talk about uh, the leading digitalization projects in certain countries i i would uh, say that uh, it it is the smart city or safe city because uh, this is something which can be generalized in all the countries we have a safe city or small city project for example in kyrgyzstan previously it was smart city now they call it safe city the digitalization program in kyrgyzstan previously it was called tazakom now it is digital kyrgyzstan under the umbrella of this digital kyrgyzstan there are number of projects uh, and one of them is uh, electronic government actually they imported it the infrastructure they imported from the estonia and estonia we know that taking lead when it comes to the electronic government so uh, recently they have uh, you know installed uh, cameras and now the people who do the you know the traffic violations they can they can be tracked easily and they can receive the bills with the photo of the violation at their home address this technology of cameras have been bought from the huawei's and there are different opinions about the benefits of these technologies we will discuss it later if we talk about uzbekistan uzbekistan also has a smart city project earlier uh you know this year there was a huge discussion on this last year in 2019 it was introduced and under the heading of this uh, you know smart city project there are number of other projects including smart transport smart medicine smart education housing communal services uh, smart hakmiyat uh, which is their mayor Uh, and uh, smart mohalla which is their uh, areas where they reside so everything they are trying to make smart means they are trying to incorporate the elements of digitalization in uh, kazakhstan kazakhstan is technologically obviously very advanced as compared to its neighboring countries and uh, the project last year was introduced uh, which is uh, uh, a city near astana a coal uh it has been uh, you know labeled as a smart city but uh, this um, smart city is um, a very secure city means the elements which make it smart is the security not uh, the other facilities uh but we should give credit to the kazakhstan that the kazakhstan has uh, very developed privacy laws or the laws related to the big data management or the data sharing so kazakhstan is taking lead in the region 
if we talk about Tajikistan, uh, Tajikistan has a project, Smart City Dushambe Initiative 2020. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the World Bank is helping, Government of Korea is helping to try to, you know, implement this project in uh, Tajikistan. So uh, Smart City is, uh, or Safe City is the project which can be a generalized indicator of digitalization when it comes to the impact on individuals in the country. Yeah. So now a little bit about the latest technology laws in region. Uh, I have just taken uh, the laws which uh, are um, uh, introduced in this year or the last year. Uh, if we talk about Kyrgyzstan, uh, last month, uh, uh, the Kyrgyzstan introduced uh, the, the law related to the uh, information sharing through electronic uh, documents, cross-border information sharing through electronic documents. And it is very important law because they follow the guidelines which comes from, from the Eurasian Economic Union. So Eurasian Economic Union had some guidelines and they followed that, those guidelines and incorporated those international laws into their local laws, which also give strength to my theory, which I'm going to propose that Central Asia should have their own journalized laws. If we talk about uh, uh, Tajikistan, in uh, Tajikistan, we have, uh, uh, you know, the concept of digital economy is relevant, uh, relatively new as compared to some of the other uh, neighboring countries. <clears throat> but last year, uh, the order of government was to introduce a digital economy in uh, Tajikistan and the project is expected to complete until 2030. Yes, and uh, earlier this year in March, uh, this is very interesting that Tajikistan uh, uh, made a law about the personal data protection of the passengers means the data which has been collected how this data will be utilized so this is something very important which uh, they did this year yeah if we talk about uzbekistan many changes took place during this year and the last year earlier this year the president announced that the year 2020 will be the year of uh, development of science education and digital economy so under the umbrella of digital e economy there are so many new projects are being developed the ministries are getting derivatives state institutions not only state institution but the non government organization private businesses they are also trying to incorporate this digital economy thing into their uh, systems Earlier this uh, year in February, uh, a very important uh, legal progression took place in Uzbekistan uh, when uh, they actually issued, uh, Central Bank issued the regulations uh, about uh, the management of electronic money. So this uh, law provides exclusive definitions of uh, very important terms which we use in e-commerce or when we deal with the, uh, you know, money, uh, electronic money, for example, uh, e-wallet, what is digital transaction, what, what is uh, prepaid card payment system, what is money making and money moving, how money making is different from money moving. So these sort of things which are very important when it comes to the technology law. This law was proposed, uh, a proposal, uh, and it was open for discussion that Uzbekistan is introducing a crypto national mining pool. Uh, cryptocurrency is banned, but uh, this mining pool will be developed and people who have cryptocurrency, they can, they can use it as an exchange. So I gave a proposal on this uh, law that instead of having this mining pool, uh, in any case, you are, you are allowing people to, to you know, uh, deal in uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. Why not to have your own crypto mining tank? So this law was open for discussion and uh, let's see what will be the outcome of this. If we talk about Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan also proposed a law in March about uh, electronic documents. And uh, interestingly, they provided exclusive definitions of what is an electronic message or uh, the digital signature. The digital signature is a very hot topic in technology law. So Turkmenistan has mentioned exclusive definition of digital signature and electronic message in this uh, new law. 
when it comes to kazakhstan there are so many laws and previous laws are being amended to make it more and more relevant to the existing laws and uh, with the demands of uh, era so there is a presidential decree uh, of uh, 2018 which actually called upon the digitalization of uh, kazakhstan and uh, recently i mean uh, in this month in june 2020 uh there is a very interesting law which is about the uh use of data as a commodity and exchange of data so again the kazakhstan is uh, taking lead how to manage the data uh, in the region so this was this was an overview of digitalization and some of the modern laws in uh, in uh, central asian region and i took only only these modern laws because uh, the advanced laws can give uh, the background of the previous laws but uh, this is something which i want to discuss and the purpose of uh, this two days webinar is to discuss about the emerging cases or the emerging issues in technology and law for which the central asia should be ready so the first issue which i think is uh, the issue of digital content the digital content is uh, actively being produced by businesses digital content i mean uh, um, music and uh, videos and video games or smartphone applications and softwares all of these things which uh, we can buy digitally these are digital content there is a discussion among central asian legal scholars that this uh, digital content is uh, is uh, something which we buy or the medium on which this digital content is presented we buy this for example if you buy a cd do you buy the content inside the cd or do you buy the physical cd so these types of discussions are taking place but unfortunately no one has you know shed a light or didn't try to provide an exclusive definition of digital content in the region uh it is very important because we need to consider the remedies of digital content sale sale of digital content for example if you buy a music and if you don't like music you want to get your money back but the seller can say that you have already listened the music or if you buy a software and you use this software the seller can say that you have already used the software and i will not pay your money back so in these types of scenarios uh, we need to define certain laws that what will be the remedies for the buying and selling of uh, digital content yes then we also need to define what is not digital content for example for example if you buy something online obviously it is a physical thing means you order something online through an uh, uh, e-commerce channel you are actually buying the physical product it is not the e-commerce but in certain international jurisdiction uh, these are considered as digital content so it is also very important to define what is digital content and what is not digital content also it is very important to think about how to deal with free digital content sometimes you get digital content for free for example if you buy a windows uh, if you buy a laptop windows come for free or if you buy a program uh, the antivirus come for free or if you buy a mobile phone the software is pre installed which comes for free what will be the remedy if the software is not working you haven't paid money for the software you have paid money for that physical good but it is an important legal questions about which we need to think that how to deal with the free digital content which comes with the physical goods also there is a need to make laws about the modifications and updates for example you have bought a digital content and now this digital content will be updated for example the windows or mobile phone software it constantly updates uh, so will you pay extra money for the updates or if those updates have spoiled your physical good for example mobile phone or your computer what will be the remedy of this thing so there is a need to discuss these things as well sometimes digital content comes with the physical content means you cannot buy only digital content and you cannot buy only physical content and for this purpose we need to make mix contract the contract for digital contract 
the con digital content and the contract for physical goods. So these kinds of uh, mixed contracts are already there in uh, civil codes of many countries, including Central Asian countries. But uh, with the, the introduction of this digital content, there is a need to revise the mixed contract, uh, which is already present in uh, many civil codes in Central Asian countries. And this question, which I earlier mentioned that uh, when a seller sells the digital content, he cares about the intellectual property, how to satisfy the seller that his intellectual property will not be infringed. This is something which should be discussed by the legal scholars in Central Asia. These things, which seems that they are things, for example, if you buy, you know, likes on Instagram, or if you buy, you know, the followers on Instagrams, they are not traceable, but you have paid money for this. And uh, how to deal with these types of scenarios? These are digital contract and uh, digital content, but there is no track. And uh, obviously there, are, there is no law at present. So how to deal with these types of scenarios when you do buying and selling of digital content, which is uh, untraceable, but you are willing to buy that digital content. Yes. So after digital content, I would like to talk about the medical technologies and legal challenges. Now, many people, they consider that uh, this is the subject matter of medical law. Yes, it is the subject matter of medical law, but uh, uh, with the introduction of new technologies, uh, it has become the subject matter of the technology law as well, because the doctors or the patient, they rely not on the person only, but they, they hu hugely you know, put their trust into the technology which uh, is being used. For example, uh, there are, there are uh, uh, so many clinics in almost all the Central Asian big countries which are providing, you know, laser surgery for, for uh, eyesight correction. Uh, the patient usually does not, uh, does not rely on the doctor only, but it rely on the technology as well. So there is a need to regulate those technologies as well. Uh, you can actually make money from your DNA because your DNA contains data. So there is a buying and selling of data going on. On the other side, there is data on your DNA and there are many people, many pharmaceutical in industries which are interested in buying your data which is present on your DNA. So what you can do, you can, you can simply upload your genetic sequencing or the DNA can be decoded by the companies. You put it on the internet you can do the privacy setting and then the buyers will find you and they will pay you money for this but uh, unfortunately there are no regulations when it comes to you know the dealing these types of data in central asia uh, our scientists in central asia the medical scientists biotechnologists genetic engineers they are working on uh, designer babies to some extent means uh, the embryo screening is being done and there is a possibility in future there will be designer babies where you can actually choose the color of the eyes or the color of hairs or the height or maybe IQ in future. But uh, the experimentation of this level where the highly sophisticated technology is involved requires regulations. Yes, this is something which is happening in Central Asia. These are called as bio boats. So half of the component of this uh, boat is made up of metal and half of the components of these uh, boats are made up of biological material. Means half of it is, uh, let's say steel and half of it is, it is protein. And there are a number of applications of these things starting from bionic eyes to the artificial limbs and so on. So it becomes very complicated that how you will differentiate between uh, these types of robots means they have some elements of biology and uh, and uh, there are no regulations means how to treat these biobots should we treat them as an ordinary physical good or they are something uh, you know they have some sanctity just because they have some biological components in them so there is a need to discuss about this because experimentation is going on this is something which we all know and it is happening in central asia and all over the world from a long period of time 
people can get artificial uh, te teeth people can uh, you know the medical scientists they have been using the skeleton people can get uh, the hair extension made up of human hairs uh, people have been donating blood so these buying and selling of these things have been taking place uh, by the way interestingly turkmenistan is uh, the country in in the region which has a full fledged law on the donation of blood so the complications are arising with the, the buying and selling of these things which we need to address by making new laws because again the highly sophisticated technologies are involved iran our neighboring country has made a law related to the buying and selling of kidneys unfortunately there are no laws in central asian regions when it comes to the buying and selling of uh, uh, you know the human body part or or the sophisticated treatment of this why we need to make law because this is a interesting phenomena on which central asian scientists are working right now which is the 3d printed body parts <clears throat> so the 3d printed body parts are are a reality people are very hopeful to reap the positive benefits of 3d printed body parts our universities some of the very uh, you know advanced um, research center in central asian regions they are actually doing experiments on uh, these 3d print printed body parts hopefully they will be available very soon in the market but uh, uh, to foresee or to do a risk management to eliminate the criminal elements when it comes to the making of 3d printed body parts or buying and selling of 3d printed body parts we need to make rules and regulations <clears throat> this is a even interesting phenomena and i wouldn't count uh, you know i wouldn't wouldn't talk about it if i wouldn't read this novel so this novel is uh, written by uh, don de lilo american novelist he wrote this in uh, if i'm not mistaken in 2016 and he talked about cryonics so what is cryonics uh, uh, he he mentioned about kazakhstan means means in the plot of the novel he mentioned about a research facility which is uh, Uh, located in kazakhstan so it of course it is a fictional fictional story but since they have mentioned kazakhstan so it becomes relevant because uh, the the similar people who are actually interested in doing these types of experiments they can they can use central asia as a potential ground so what is cryonics cryonics is uh, something uh, which was shy fi a couple of decade ago but today it is becoming reality because people are actually investing in this area of uh, uh, technology so cryonics is that when you know that you are about to die uh, you can contact with the company and the company can uh, preserve your bodies in one of these capsules uh, with this hope that after 50 year or 100 year when they will be technologically advanced they will bring back to life this body Uh, this is actually happening and uh, to certain extent there are experiments which are being done by central asian institutions uh, for example regeneration of the limbs or how to grow if uh, your body part is damaged it has some elements of cryonics and the advanced advanced uh, cryonics is something here which i can, I, i have shown you Uh, and it requires new rules and regulations or at least we have to do the risk management because the uh, central asian society is very sensitive society uh, when it comes to these types of technologies yes this is uh, also an interesting phenomena which is which is autonomous robotic surgery uh, i meant i gave an example of this uh, retina correction or eyesight correction in central asia it is happening everywhere but uh, many big hospitals they have installed autonomous robots uh, which can uh, do the treatment of uh, uh, the humans means uh, they can be used for operations unfortunately not many laws are available because uh, uh, you know our, our usual trend is let the technology come and if something wrong will happen then we will make new laws but it shouldn't be vice versa so many hospitals are using autonomous robotic surgery we need to make uh, new laws about it because there are so many liabilities issues related to this for example uh, if a robot does a surgery which goes wrong who will be liable robot will liable uh, liable uh, the doctor will liable 
or the company which has manufactured this robot uh, that company will be liable it is better to uh, you know consider this in advance we have this uh, phenomena of uh, nanomedicine not many laws are there in this region but uh, there is a need to make uh, new laws about uh, the production of nanomedicine and then further uh, regulation and buying and selling of uh, uh, nanomedicine yes uh, this is uh, this is something uh, you can say that advancement in uh, in uh, central asian region uh, fortunately almost all the central asian countries have laws related to abortion but uh, in developed countries these abortions are not simply uh, a choice per se means you can go and buy it, a pill and you can do the abortion no you have to do, uh, do the abortion under the supervision of a medical professional and uh, this make it a hybrid product hybrid product means you buy a product and you buy a service means you buy a product which is abortion pill and then you need to take this pill under the supervision of a doctor so these hybrid products not only these abortion pills but many other products are in market which requires the supervision of a qualified specialist so there is a need to consider the regulations of these hybrid products where you buy a product but this product cannot be used without the supervision of the specialist so uh, for now uh, the 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 legal scientists in central asia uh, they are not considering these types of products so after medical technologies this is the classic of technology law as i earlier mentioned when we say technology law people think that we are talking about intellectual property law intellectual property law is the subject matter of technology law but intellectual property has become very advanced for example this is a cutting of a newspaper from from uh, you know the chinese newspaper and uh, uh, last year in 2019 a very interesting case happened where the internet court internet court which is also a robot and uh, the lawyers of both parties mean mean the the party a and party b both were represented by the robots so the both parties are being represented by the robot lawyers and the judge is also a robot and it is an actual case so this is something for which we should be ready because we are the neighboring country of of china and uh, our technologists are the, the when it comes to the automation they are actually working on on these autonomous robots uh, microsoft has uh, projects in central asia this is a robot which is the the microsoft uh, you know they, they are very proud on this and this robot has written books and uh, previously it was called as computer generated work uh, but now since there are elements of artificial intelligence it is called as uh, autonomous uh, output of artificial intelligence so so what if uh, a robot produce a work like this who will be the owner of intellectual property robot itself the owner of uh, this uh, uh, you know intellectual uh, work or the manufacturer of the robot uh, so these types of questions they are contemporary questions we need to think about this how, how these ro robots are writing these books or painting the pictures or you know uh, uh, many interesting things they are doing for example they they are creating different scenarios or <clears throat> or they are predicting so they are doing this by using artificial neural networks i will not go into this uh, uh, detail technological detail but uh, my point is that uh, technologically robots have become advanced enough that they can generate the autonomous output and it is the question that who is the owner of the autonomous output of ai uh, this is a scenario which uh, is uh, being neglected by the intellectual property scholars in our region i have tried to talk with uh, some intellectual property lawyers and even state bodies which regulate intellectual property and they say that this is this is not for us means we are not technologically advanced and we should wait but i think that when the scientists in your region are doing experiments and they are actually producing computer generated work 
which has a potential to be counted as autonomous output of AI, we should make laws and regulations. This is something which is happening in the region, which is called as IP audit. So there are no rules and regulations related to IP audit. So what is IP audit? Like an ordinary financial audit, you can do the intellectual property audit of your company. Uh, and it has been observed that the, con the companies who uh, you know, do their intellectual property audits, they are more for consumer rights, means they are more confident in their product and they provide better services. So there are different law firms in our regions which provide you the services of IP audit or intellectual property audits, but this is not being followed by, you know, any, any formal set of, set of laws and rules. There are general international guidelines, there are different methodologies, but uh, this highly sophisticated work should be regulated as our financial audits are being regulated in the region. Yes, the law on personal data protection, fortunately, almost all the countries, they are working on uh, personal data protection. Uh, cameras have been installed, but there is a new emerging debate, which is privacy versus security debate. The Chinese facial recognition technologies are available. Recently in our, uh, you know, I'm currently located in uh, Tashkent. In Tashkent metros, they have introduced these facial recognition technologies cameras. Uh, in Kazakhstan they, and in Kyrgyzstan, they are already using these uh, facial recognition technologies. Uh, China has their full-fledged social surveillance system. And there are so many threats related to this that uh, by introducing these technologies, governments are trying to control us. Or uh, there is a you know, controversy attached to the COVID-19 vaccine. <laughs> Means many people are saying in this region that by introducing this vaccine, people are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the so-called best trends, they want to control us by putting certain chips in, in our bodies. But uh, a general debate around this uh, uh, facial recognition technology or the surveillance or uh, the privacy is that uh, are we willing to compromise our privacy on the cost of security? Do we need privacy or do we need more security? If we need more security, then we have to compromise on privacy. But if you care more about privacy, then security will be compromised. So they, this is something on uh, a point on which uh, the Central Asian population should be taken uh, into confidence. So when it comes to the, uh, you know, the role of China into the technological development, more specifically about uh, these cameras, which almost all the Central Asian countries have bought from China. Uh, there are positive comments. Uh, scientists are saying that they are very advanced technology, so that's why these are beneficial. But many people, they are worried about their uh, personal data or privacy. They think that um, the, they, they, they shouldn't be bought by Chinese because that data is being transferred and so on. So if there are proper regulations, on buying and selling of these types of surveillance technologies, uh, then I think that the Central Asian populates will be more confident and maybe some, some of uh, the local scientists would like to invest in, in these uh, uh, you know, technologies. So next I would like to talk a little bit about the upcoming legal challenges by artificial intelligence. Currently in our civil codes, in our Central Asian civil laws, there are two subjects of civil law. One is the natural person and another is the legal persons. But there is a third personality which is emerging, which is called as the digital personhood. It is very relevant because the European Union is formally discussing the concept of digital personhood. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, there, there are some robots, for example, the Sofia, we know that the Saudi Arabia has given her a passport and Sofia is a full fledged citizen of uh, Saudi Arabia. So there should be a separate category as a subject matter of civil law or the subject matter of law in general, which should be labeled as a digital personhood. So the proposal is, I think that there should be natural person, which we already have like humans, 
the legal person which are our organizations and it will be very beneficial for us if we would have these digital persons uh, to include all of these uh, artificial intelligence embedded robots and so on into this category uh, then you don't need to modify these laws related to natural person and the legal persons again and again you can simply refer to the laws related to the digital person which will be much more easy and much more easy to you know regulate uh, in our uh, neighboring countries people are uh, you know actually doing uh, marriages with the robots and uh, our Central Asian countries, they are making laws about uh, marrying uh, of locals with foreigners. But uh, this is something which is happening, you know, if we are making laws related to the marriage of local citizen with a foreigner, uh, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is not very far from today's time. We should consider this, that how to, you know, incorporate uh, these. If someone someone gets uh, emotionally attached to a robot in China recently, one engineer made a robot and then he claimed the passport for the robot because uh, he was so much emotionally attached to this and he considered this uh, robot as his wife. And uh, in uh, Japan and Korea, many people are marrying with the holograms. Uh, in terms of technology, nothing is very advanced for us. In the blink of an eye, in a click, uh, you know, it can it can come in in this region. So we should be ready for ready for this. Yes, it is important because the concept of agency is there. But if a robot, which is uh, uh, you know loaded with artificial intelligence, you you consider it as your legal agency. Uh, we need to define the juristic act when it comes to the robot. Means uh, certain acts they should be considered as juristic acts and other acts should be considered as normal acts means not all the acts of a human or a physical natural or a digital person should be considered as juristic act there should be a criteria for for juristic acts means which acts are uh, you know the legally binding or which acts these are just ordinary acts so 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 th this phenomenon of juristic act should be there in our our civil codes uh, it is very important uh, also we have seen so many discussions and uh, it came from uh, Amer america and uh, some of the other european countries people are talking about the agency people are talking about in the context of company law people are talking about in the context of contract agency law that uh, uh, if uh, something happens if you if you use the service of a company who will be liable the person who has administrated these services or the company which has employed this. So I think that there is a need to refine these laws uh, in Central Asia as well. The future of agency uh, in Central Asia should be defined in terms of the autonomous action, as I previously mentioned. In terms of the shared liability by the principal means who will be the liable, the robot will liable, or the person who has manufactured, or the person who was controlling, who will be the liable. Uh, and in terms of the juristic act means which of the act of a person, individual or robots, they are legally binding and which are not legally binding. So these are some of the things which should be incorporated. Smart contracts are becoming very, you know, you know, in, in when it comes to the contract law in this region, people have different opinions. Uh, smart contracts uh, which are based on the blockchain technology they are rigid means you cannot modify this but the traditional contacts they contracts they have some elements of uh, uh, flexibility and it is good for the small businesses because small businesses they cannot execute a contract hundred percent for example if i buy a car and the car my demand is that the car should run uh, 140 kilometers per hour but if this car is running 130 km per hour, I can say that, okay, this is fine. But if this contract is signed through blockchain, this car is not running 140 km per hour, the contract will not be executed. So this is, this is actually bad for small and medium-sized businesses because they play on this flexibility principle. 
so by introducing the smart contracts you are making everything so much rigid or uh, you are expecting the 100 percent act uh, you know execution of the contract there should be laws related to this are we ready or if we are not ready we should foresee and make uh, relevant laws to facilitate our small and medium sized businesses because they are not technologically advanced to create uh, their contracts based on blockchain technology 5g and internet of thing is becoming an interesting phenomena internet of thing is that everything will be equipped with the with the internet uh, kazakhstan and tajikistan has already launched in uzbekistan and kyrgyzstan they are testing their 5g technology again it is uh, you know somehow supported by the chinese companies and all of those those smart smart cities which we discussed earlier they are expected to be equipped with 5g technologies but coming up with this 5g technology the other phenomena is coming emerging which is called as internet of tort for example when uh, your your refrigerator is equipped with the 5g technology and it can automatically order products from a supermarket and and the supermarket can deliver these products to your doorstep uh, now you come at home and you find these products and you see that uh, you didn't want to have these products. It is actually your 5G equipped refrigerator which order these on your behalf. And similarly, there is a possibility of criminal activities. Uh, so this new emerging phenomena, Internet of Tort, should be taken into consideration. Our legal scientists should make uh, laws related to uh, you know, 5G technology and the Internet of Things. Also, 5G technology is important because it cross, it stand at the junction of number of other areas of law. So this is just a sketch. This is just a sketch that how the 5G technology is expected to deliver. So there will be these uh, sky ships of 5G technology, which will, you know, flying in the outer space or somewhere, somewhere near our ground. And they will be, you know, giving these 5G signals to, to different uh, 5G loaded components in our home. Uh, now there are issues related to the privacy again, there are issues related to the aviation law, there are issue, issues related to the communication law, we should foresee them and we should make proper laws related to them. Uh, we haven't have, uh, you know, yet uh, loaded 5G in our region, but people are talking about 6G or uh, the other phenomena is com quant quantum computing. So quantum computing and the 6G when there will be the mixture of quantum computing with 6g there will be another boom uh, this is something for which we should be ready at least uh, we should be conscious about about the positive and negative impact of these advanced technology if we are not willing to make laws about about these things in our legal systems uh, in our laws existing laws uh, there is something which is called as act of god there is something which is called as force majors, uh, uh, and uh, but but there are many interesting discussions which stands at the junction of act of God and negligence, uh, act of man and uh, force major means where the threshold of act of God ends and the threshold of act of man starts. With the advancement of the technology, now it is a time to define that negligence or act of God and force majors or act of God, act of man how these things will be differentiated when uh, the technology will uh, intervene in our daily lives yes uh, laws related to augmented reality or virtual reality we all know what are the augmented realities and virtual reality uh, this is more controversial than 3d printing because uh, all the all the central asian countries they have some sort of projects related to the augmented reality for example uh, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, in uh, certain schools, they, the students now they are being uh, you know taught by by using these uh, uh, virtual tools, virtual reality tools. In Uzbekistan, they have some projects. In uh, Kyrgyzstan, recently they were discussing about the Kyrgyz culture via augmented reality means you can see by wearing these goggles, and the Google goggles are coming in the market. Uh, this is something which you have seen in your uh, in your local media that a Korean uh, Korean company organized a virtual meeting of a mother with her dead 
baby so so the children the child of this lady was uh, was uh, was uh, you know uh, died and then this company organized a virtual meeting means uh, uh, apparently this female can feel 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 the body as well because of these gloves but this is a very sensitive sensitive technology when you are using these things for these types of scenarios of course there is a need to regulate these things uh, uh, when you are playing with the emotions of uh, anyone some people are taking it uh, positively and some people they are criticizing on it that there was no need to to you know organize these sort of uh, meetings of uh, uh, you know your dead relatives in the virtual reality this is very interesting phenomena the second life i wouldn't mention about it but recently a software house contacted with me to to get my you know suggestions on on a similar similar scenario so what is uh, second life or other uh, virtual worlds of this type you you can install this game you can uh, you can assign yourself another body inside the game uh, it can be your avatar or you can be a different person in the game now in that game you can you can do anything whatever you want because it is a full fledged life you can do buying and selling you can construct a house you can be a painter in another life inside the video game or inside this other real world and you can actually buy and sell the products with the other members of this game and many people are actually taking these cases for example this person uh whose avatar constructed a house in the game and someone else inside the game copied this house so this person went to the court uh, with a case of intellectual property infringement even though these all things are happening inside these virtual worlds but people are going to the original courts so now the time has come that we should uh, give proper guidelines to these type, types of things that uh, that uh, are going to come in the region in next 5 or 10 years maybe earlier people are also discussing about the human right dimension of these virtual world means you can find many games where you kill different people you can you can find many games where you slaughter these animals and many people especially the advocates of human rights or the animal rights they are against these things because there are no regulations you make a video game and inside the video game whatever you want you can do but this is something which should be regulated because uh, uh, many people in our region they are enthusiastically uh, you know producing new mobile application and the software on daily basis then it comes to the financial technologies and legal legal constraints uh, e-commerce has become the part especially after the covid 19 uh, there are so many business models based on the you know the types of participants business to consumer consumer to consumer government to consumer different types of goods and different types of business model drop shipping warehousing private labeling now you can make numerous business models for example business to consumer model which is selling physical goods by using the drop shipping this is one model and you can just multiply these with each other and there will be so many new business models for e-commerce and each of these business model requires specific laws to regulate it delivery and payment there are laws uh, we know that there were check and checks can bounce but now when um, all, almost all the countries have digital payment system uh, when the things went wrong how these things will be you know tackled for example this is a chinese software wechat there is an option you can actually click on this apparently the person to whom you have paid the money he will consider that he has received the money but this money will not be transferred so it is like the bouncing a check so these things should be regulated when it comes to the money movers in our central asian countries and there are number of softwares available for moving money from one place to another almost all the banks have introduced their own software for money moving when it comes to the digital currencies many people think that the digital currency has nothing to do with the international trade but we have this very interesting uh, i would say that a theory or controversy or or whatever you can say that uh, the 
the it is a perfect example that how your local currency can can change the destiny of your country so uh, when it comes to manufacturing the technologies which can produce digital currencies or even if you are doing data mining for a digital currency which is not uh, 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 you know being regulated by the laws of your country still you are suspected of doing some sort of illegal activities by your by your uh, intelligence agencies or financial uh, agencies of your countries so it is better to provide a room for those people who are interested in cryptocurrencies or buying and selling of uh, cryptocurrencies or digital currencies or just they are mining for those uh, cryptocurrencies uh, because they are uh, highly, in, high, uh, highly influenced by the uh, international factors and international actors. Almost all the regulations related to drones are controversial. Uh, at the first instance, you cannot bring a drone in the country but drone has many positive benefits more drones are being used for deliveries and uh, in many countries uh, in in the world actually this has become the reality and experiments are going on in central asian region also that uh, especially in the covid 19 periods many con many companies are seriously considering to use drones for delivery and there is a need to make laws about uh, uh, you know drones in in, in our region about logistics you cannot differentiate means this company is providing uh, uh, logistics it is it is a carrier or it is a seller for example this chinese uh, taobao they they are they are seller and uh, many people just buy from these online magazines because it comes by post so they apparently don't need this project but they just try to you know use the mobile phone and they enjoy the process when order comes uh, a, a parcel arrive at their doorstep so they sometimes share the risk with the seller means uh, they don't care about the product they don't care about the quality of the product they just want to enjoy the process means you have ordered something online and then a parcel arrived your your doorstep you you enjoy this process so just to enjoy this process they are they are using these uh, things and uh, they are compromising on the quality and uh, you know the whole logistics uh, uh, things the supply chain in in general means they don't care about it they just uh, want to get the satisfaction out of this process uh, which should be regulated because uh, because even though you want to satisfy yourself by enjoying the process there should be no compromise on the quality of the product which you are receiving there is a need to define the lifetime guarantee there are some uh, saroki or the periods or the duration which are mentioned in certain central asian laws but when it comes to the uh, technology or the second hand technological goods uh, with the concept of uh, lifetime guarantee there is a need to define what is a lifetime guarantee when it comes to the buying and selling of the technology then we need to calculate the social cost of technological goods uh, means that you don't only buy the technology you also also impact on the society for example you buy the petrol of five dollars uh, the social cost will be nine dollar because this five dollar which you have paid but uh, the congestion or the pollution is uh, being added into into this and in in total the social cost will be much more high so when you are introducing new technologies you should calculate the social cost uh, because certain technologies have very high social cost and it will be only possible when there will be regulations beforehand before introducing the uh, technology then there are issues related to corporate social responsibility and sale of goods uh, technological goods means uh, people are talking about the labor rights employment rights uh, robots are going to change we should give confidence to our people that this is not going to happen in in the earlier uh, you know couple of years but uh, uh, we need to strength laws related to the corporate social responsibility or the corporate laws in in general because there is a threat of uh, automation in any industry laws related to environmental audit <clears throat> means it is being calculated the biological footprint 
the sorry the carbon footprint of the companies is being calculated but it is becoming highly sophisticated uh, without any laws uh, just the companies who are providing the support for environmental audit they are importing regulations outside of the region we need to have our own regulations and uh, this is an interesting phenomenon all of us know these uh, gmo free food uh, almost all the central asian countries have uh, some enthusiastic who are working on gmo free food but unfortunately very less regulations are there this is also a subject matter of the technology law because highly sophisticated technology is involved again a, a theoretical question where we stand uh, when it comes to the technology i think that the technology is uh, the fourth generation of human rights it it can be it can be you know labeled somewhere here uh, the first generation was uh, social and political right uh, economic and political civil rights the second generation the third generation was uh, the rights of uh, vulnerable people and now we are living in the era of fourth generation of human rights which includes uh, consumer rights and the technological rights so from the rights perspective also it is very important to take the question of uh, uh, making new technological laws seriously uh, another theoretical point that why technological laws cannot be imported uh, i have uh, uh, a theory about it and uh, i think that uh, the ideological background of central asian countries are completely different from the ideological backgrounds of some of the other countries such as post colonial or the socialist countries or uh, uh, you know the other countries which are uh, uh, following another ideologies uh the ideological context impact a lot when it comes to making new laws for example in case of banking laws the banking laws in post colonial countries are uh, more close to the criminal law uh, for example the threshold when a civil case will become criminal case is very low in uh, post colonial countries for example central asia it is a matter of uh, civil law uh and it is very unlikely that a civil case will become a criminal case and in socialist country there are some elements of uh, uh, criminal law and the civil law when it comes to the banking laws means uh, you have to give the money also and you will be punished if you do something wrong so when it comes to the making of new law in a country the ideological context is uh, something which influence and that should be considered when making a new laws related to the technology and that is why we cannot simply import technology laws from other countries because those laws have been formed by keeping in mind the ideological context of those countries so all of us all the countries need an ai policy ai policy in other words is a technological policy means there should be a policy at a at a higher level and we should have a top down approach means a country wise or a region wise there should be a technological policy and all the institutions who are working in the area of technology should follow the guidelines coming through those policies then we will have uh, then we could see the dots connecting with each other and then we will able to reap the benefits of uh, these uh, technologies yes these uh, uh, technologies are related to all of these sustainable development goals in order to achieve the sustainable development goals of un we need to work on the technologies and the technologies need to be regulated and the regulations will come by our seriousness in making new laws uh, this spectrum shows the countries which have made their generalized ai policies unfortunately central asia is not there any of the central asian country does not have a centralized technological policy or centralized ai policy they have policies related to the digitalization but as i mentioned earlier that this digitalization is something related to the automation uh, it is not related to the regulation so we need a centralized ai policy or technology policy in our uh, region yes so what is the idea of central asia tech law central asia tech law means uh, uh, 
the region i have explained by giving different example it has its individuality so central asian region should think about their own journalized ai policy uh, in the beginning of the webinar i gave the example of kyrgyzstan who recently adopted a law to incorporate eurasian uh, economic unions regulations so why not to have our own journalized policy at central asia level because uh, we can understand the demands of our neighboring countries and when it comes to the technological transfer all the central asian countries should have a single stand uh, a number of things can be done and uh, i really want that uh, the ai fc academy of law or the audience who are listening me some of the scholars some of the academic institutions should consider about uh, the central asian uh, uh, you know tech law journal or the other journal related to the technology in central asia to contextualize this yes so this is the demand of ira so that the legal scholar can discuss and propose uh, the changes which are required yes so i would like to end by giving these three by posing these three questions to think upon the first question is we should think that how we can use law to incentivize new technologies It means new technologies are coming and we cannot uh, make regulations to stop these technology we need these technologies but we need to make those laws so that the technology can be incentivized secondly how do we use laws to regulate the use of new technology which is the demand of era new technologies are there but there are no laws to regulate it so we need to use law to regulate these technologies and third question is that how we can use technologies to improve our technology law this is something which we discussed today that uh, if a new technology comes we shouldn't simply allow this but we need to contextualize it with our region and we need to improve our regional laws if we have a new technology so with these questions uh, i would end my uh, presentation thank you very much if you have any questions uh, i am ready to take these questions thank you very much uh, professor yunas Uh, I believe um, my colleague Almas uh, has a couple of questions that have come in on the chat. I think we have two, so I'll go ahead and uh, turn that over to uh, to, to Almas. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, dear guest, for your questions. We have received it, like many of them, and uh, I will ask to send them via email because of this time exceeding. So I will read two of them. First is from Zulaikha Muratova. Her, uh, her question is: Could you please tell about success stories, uh, international best practices on counter cyber crime? Kazakhstan uh, has poor experience in this area. How can it be improved? Yes, as uh, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, there are some areas in which uh, the Central Asian region has done uh, uh, exponential growth, and one of those areas is uh, cyber crime. Uh, almost all the law enforcement agencies or all the ministry of interiors in central asian countries they have a specific department which is uh, related to tech uh, which is actually tackling this the issue of cyber crime and uh, we don't need to you know look at uh, the best practices i i think that the central asia is doing very well when it comes to the cyber security and cyber crime even some uh, individual enthusiastic some uh, some computer scientists they are doing this for free just because of their patriotic feeling for their country means they constantly monitor the external threats and uh, uh they can uh, you know refer if something is very dangerous to the law enforcement agencies so in 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 the area of cyber crimes and cyber security i think that central asia is already doing very well yes okay thank you uh, the second is and the last was for now is uh, from aigul from kazakhstan I have a question regarding cryptocurrency ban in Uzbekistan that the speaker has mentioned uh, about. Would it be possible to clarify and give more insight about the cryptocurrency uh, concept and its development in Uzbekistan particularly? Uh, as for cryptocurrency is concerned, 
uh, and I mentioned that all the governments obviously they are they 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 take it as a threat that you can you cannot introduce a parallel currency to the existing currency. So what they are doing for now in Uzbekistan or what is being planned to do is that the people have these cryptocurrencies. Uh, so government is allowing them to, you know, exchange. They, you can do buying and selling of cryptocurrency through these mining poles, which are being being made. But uh, you cannot generate, you cannot make new cryptocurrency, or you cannot uh, buy cryptocurrency. Uh, you can just uh, do the exchange of existing cryptocurrency. And uh, the governmental, you know, uh, why they are, they, they are doing this, uh, it is obvious because no one wants to have a uh, parallel currency to the existing currency until unless the government introduced their own cryptocurrency. And recently a news has come from China that China has introduced their own cryptocurrency. Uh, hopefully in future in the region, uh, if there will be a need, the countries will think about introducing their own cryptocurrency. But for now, there is no, you know, the, logistically it is not possible for for central banks or the other banks or our banking system in, in a journal to allow people to have their own cryptocurrencies yes yep on that point thank you uh, to other guests please uh, feel free to send your questions to our email we'll be pleased to answer them and thank you amar for your presentation great thank uh, you much. yeah professor amar on behalf of the aifc academy of law we are very grateful for your, your time. Your presentation was absolutely superb, uh, filled with relevant and meaningful content and insights. And stay tuned, with new technologies, we have new legal issues and new legal risks. And systems of law need to be developed to accommodate uh, the changing needs um, of the, uh, the, the business and legal landscape. So thanks for that. We very much look forward to your upcoming webinars. I mentioned them early on and, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. To our guests, thanks so much for your participation and please stay tuned. There are many more Academy of Law webinars to come. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you very much.